when I was 33, I was the ice cream lady. That's me with purple hair. And because we hadn't had an ice cream truck in this town for over 20 years, I was pretty popular. And life was sweet. I had a great marriage, beautiful little girl, and an awesome career as a teacher when I wasn't giving out ice cream. Life felt magical. It's like my own little fairy tale. Not long after that photo was taken, my husband and I were at the grocery store and we saw a woman about the age of my grandmother struggling to push her shopping cart through the snow because she had a giant bag of dog food in it. We offered to give her a ride home and she was so grateful. She gave me a big hug. Boom. It hit me. The perfume she was wearing. I hadn't smelled it since I was in fifth grade and survived some of the scariest nights in my young life. I tried to catch my breath and she hugged me again. And I nearly threw up. That scent, a visceral reminder of being 10 and terrified. I finally got her in her house and I got in our car. I ripped off my jacket, rolled down the window and let the snow blow through. My poor worried husband, he had no idea what was happening. We got home and I got right in the shower, dropping to my knees and scrubbing the smell of her perfume off my skin. But, but I was the ice cream lady living my fairy tale. So of course, I ignored it and went on with life. Not long after, I was driving down the road and mindlessly changed the song on the radio, accidentally stopping on the classic rock station I always avoided because it seemed like every song from the 70s was a soundtrack to a childhood I'd been trying to forget. And then that song came on the one that pulled me by the collar, back to being five and scared and alone with a boy much older than me. I started crying and had to pull off the road, pounding the steering wheel with my fists and still hearing that song even though I turned the radio off. But again, I'm a happy person. So of course, I ignored it and went on with life. The final straw came. I walked into my house one evening and the smell of ground beef cooking on the stove slammed me so hard I hit the floor. And again, pounding my fists and crying. Irrationally and illogically. Because the ground beef I was crying about with its thick rancid grease that sat on the stove overnight while the monster beat my mother and aimed his gun between my eyes. It was not the ground beef my husband was innocently and regretfully cooking. What the hell was happening to make the ice cream lady nearly throw up on a poor old woman and her giant bag of dog food? Well, that was nearly 20 years ago, so I'm pretty sure most of us now know. But back then, I had to go to the World Wide Web and ask Jeeves. And it took Jeeves a few minutes to get the answer because we still had dial-up and someone kept picking up the phone. But then Jeeves told me. I'd been triggered. From SAMHSA, a trigger is any sensory reminder of the traumatic event. And the list of triggers is long. It includes smell like the woman's perfume or the ground beef, and noise, like the song on the radio, taking back to a memory we wanted to forget. And oh, I wanted to forget. Because fear lived in my house when I was little, when I was medium, and when I was big. It shouted in my face, 
shook me awake in the middle of the night and shoved my body around. Whether it was the monster my mother moved in who parked his Harley Davidson in our living room or my mother herself who, when given two choices, always chose the worst and most dangerous one. I'd lived with fear, but I had also done the hard work to evict it. Crying, writing sad poems in my journal, and belting out Courtney love songs at the top of my lungs with a cigarette that I only smoked when I was really sad and really angry. And I'd made all the right choices. I'd gone to college. I'd married a wonderful person. I'd done everything opposite from what I saw growing up. And I hadn't talked to the people who made me afraid in years. But fear wasn't going to leave without a fight. It banged on my doors, knocked on my windows, and looked for any crack in my foundation to find its way in. Triggered. No way to see it coming, and nothing to stop it from taking me down. The trauma and fear that owned my past wanted to own my present, too. Just like when I was young, it was trying to debilitate, devalue, and decide who I was and what I deserved. But then I reminded myself, I already survived. I'd been brave facing the monsters in their guns and their fists, and rescuing myself and my mom. I'd been resilient, picking myself up after being emotionally, physically, and sexually abused, getting myself ready for school. And I'd been optimistic, watching the clock in the middle of the night and waiting for the sun to come up, because when it did, that meant everything was going to be okay. We could start over and forget the night before. And I was really proud of these hard-earned and hard-learned adjectives. But maybe because I'm an English teacher and I live in a world of words, I saw something in these adjectives that I thought might be even more powerful than their descriptions. So, I rearranged their order, and I took the first letter from each one to create a powerhouse verb to direct my actions. And maybe you can use it too. Rob. Rob the trauma and steal back your life. I believe we can use our resilience and our optimism and our bravery, to rob the trauma of its power over our self-worth, deciding for ourselves who we are and what we're capable of. We can rob the trauma of its power over our choices, deciding for ourselves what we want and what we deserve. And we can rob the trauma of its ability to make us believe our past is our present and our future is fragile. But maybe those of us who've dealt with trauma and an unfortunate statistic by the National Council for Mental Wellbeing says that 70% of adults in the US have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their lives. Maybe we've hidden our resilience and our optimism and our bravery away tucked it just as deep as the experiences we want to forget because one reminds us of the other. When we want to be resilient, we're reminded of all the times we were knocked down or let down and had to pick ourselves up. When we're trying to be optimistic, we remember all the promises made by people we wanted to believe when they said this time would be different and tomorrow would be better. And when we need to be brave, we're reminded of all the times we had to be and that it wasn't a choice. 
But if we can exercise these up and out of their hiding places, then we can exercise them, using them because we earned them. They're our strengths forever. So how? Okay, so we're going to all sit up. Sit up. <sighs> Take a deep breath and exhale. We're gonna make mess, room for this message to get in because I want us to believe and remember the power we have. When that smell of her perfume or his cologne or what's cooking on the stove or what's wafting by in the breeze drops us to our knees, we remember all the times we bounced back and picked ourselves up without anybody's hand, whether it wasn't there or it was, but we didn't trust it enough to take it. And we're not people who stay down for long. We couldn't, even after a long night of fighting and broken glass and broken people. We got up, we got dressed, we got on with life. But if we are triggered, and end up on the floor, we're gonna get up faster and more confident each time because we know on our knees, we are in our past. But as we stand, we're in our present and every step forward is our future. Our resilience not only helped us bounce back, it bounces off the insults and snide comments made that we know aren't about us. They're about the people making them. The ones whose identity depends on us believing we're as broken as they are. When we hear that inner voice, whether it sounds like ours or theirs, telling us we can't and won't, our optimism is gonna tell it to shut the hell up because we can and we will. Just like our resilience was required, our optimism was conditioned. Promises we believed because we loved and trusted the people telling us the grass would be greener, he would change, she wouldn't do it again. But we can use this optimism to know without a shadow of a doubt that we can have a better life than the one that raised us or tried to break us. And we can use that optimism to trust and to give and receive love, even after being let down too many times. And we can use our optimism to have hope in our goals and our dreams that we deserve to see come true. But if we get scared or nervous, don't think we're able to achieve that goal or fulfill that dream, we have to remember our bravery. We stood up to fear and survived. We rescued others, even when it was dangerous for us. We smiled when all we wanted to do was cry. We faced neighbors and teachers and friends and family that judged where we lived, what we wore, and our excuses. We're brave because we've known real fear. So we can say yes to things other people are afraid of, like giving a TEDx talk. <laughs> We're brave enough to make really hard, really unpopular decisions because they're good for us, like leaving toxic relationships with partners, friends, and even family. We're brave enough to stand up and speak up for ourselves, defending who we are and the life we deserve. I've cried on the side of the road. I've been on my knees in the shower and I've pounded my fists on the floor. But I've also robbed the trauma and stolen back my life for good. 
when I was little. I really love the story of the Wizard of Oz. Probably because it was kind of a sad and scary fairy tale. But it had a really happy ending, which is what I wanted too. But as I got older, I realized what I really loved was that even though Dorothy thought she needed help to get home to Kansas, whether from the great and powerful Oz or Glenda the Good Witch, when she asks Glenda, the Good Witch reminds her she's had the ability all along. Now the book and the movie handle this a little differently because, did you know, the ruby slippers in the movie were actually silver shoes. Dorothy says to Glenda, but you have not yet told me how to get back. And Glenda tells her, your silver shoes will carry you. If you had known their power, you could have gone back the very first day. My hope is that if you're struggling, you remember the silver shoes you've had on the whole time too. Even if you have to be reminded by a trusted therapist, an awesome self-help book or a podcast, your best friend, a Google search about how to overcome trauma and prevent triggers, or this talk. Because if we know we have the power, then maybe when triggers happen for the first time or the next time, it'll be the last time. Thank you.